Yeah, I guess I got cut off because uh, now we are on live. I like live streaming has been done. So um, let us uh, begin our session then. I will be formally introducing you and then you are going to uh, begin your talk, which uh, we have been uh, waiting for for quite some time. Um, Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. And if you are listening from India, then I wish you all a very happy Diwali. Um, let light dispel all the darkness that resides in us. Uh, we are today very fortunate to have amongst us Dr. Paul Pickman, who is a senior lecturer in English at the University of Derby, United Kingdom. His research interests lie in the Romantic period, particularly the work of Byron, Shelley and Gates, as well as freedom of speech more broadly. He has published in journals such as Kitts Shelley Review, and was previously a contributor to the, to the year's work in English studies from 2015 to 2018. He was also the academic advisor for Gale or St. Gates' 19th century literature criticism online series on Lord Byron. Outside of the Romantics, he has a chapter in a book titled Free Speech Wars from Manchester University Press. That will be published imminently, that means next week. His book, Blasphemy and Politics in Romantic Literature, Creativity in the Writing of Percy Bysshe Shelley was published by Paul Greb in 2020. Today, uh, Dr. Wickman is going to deliver a talk entitled Shelley's Jesus. And we know that Shelley's um, relation to Jesus is a bit of a conundrum. He is known for his atheism, but at the same time, he has deep admiration for Jesus Christ's doctrine. So I now invite Dr. Wickman to deliver his, what um, expectedly is going to be a very interesting talk in which he is going to talk about these apparently contradictory features in Shelley's thought. Dr. Wickman, welcome. Welcome to Bintapur College. Welcome virtually to India. Thank you very much for that generous introduction. That was uh, very kind of you. And it's a real privilege to be invited by, uh, by Midnapore College. And it's been a long time coming with everything uh, happening in the world and the pandemics and things. But one of the advantages is that I've got a bit used to streaming talks online. So that doesn't mean that there won't be technical uh, problems. We'll see how we get we get on. Um, but yes, thank you for that introduction. This, this uh, talk is based uh, is in, uh, based on one of the chapters from my book. I should have had the book to spare so I can show you on the camera. Um, but um, but yes, this is kind of modified, and we'll see how we get on. I've got a few quotations that I'll, I'll put on the slide if they if the slides on the screen if they work. I won't read all of them out. I'll just uh, there for your reference. Um, but thank you uh, uh, very much. I'll, I'll get uh, started. So uh, can we see, um, yes, we can see, can we see my slides? Um, I assume we can. So this is just an introductory slide. Um, so despite his apparent atheism and his rejection of established Christianity, the romantic poet Percy Bysshe Shelley, that's that chap on the slide there, um, took an awful lot from the teachings of Jesus Christ. Shelley's political philosophy is clearly informed by his doctrines, with critics such as Harry White and Robert Ryan suggesting Jesus' influence on Shelley exceeds even that of William Godwin. Now, that might be a bit of an overstatement, perhaps. It is important to note, however, as Brian Shelley, now there's a chap called Brian Shelley who's written on Shelley, uh, Brian Shelley reminds us, that this, that this Jesus is very much Shelley's own reconstruction, largely, in fact, a projection of his own self-image. Far from being a simple misreading, then, there is an element of willful manipulation of Jesus to suit Shelley's political ends. Jesus is retrospectively made to fit uh, the philosophy as much as he is an out-and-out -out inspiration for it, um, hence my title today of Shelley's Jesus. While his principles are very much evident, the character of Jesus uh, also figures in a number of Shelley's poems, including Queen Mab, Prometheus Unbound, Hellas and the Triumph of Life. There are numerous Christ-like characters in Shelley's works too, such as Prometheus, Leon, Sithna, Adonais, Beatrice Sensi, 
and even Ahasuerus, the wandering Jew. The similarity of these characters to Christ is often provocative because they are frequently anti-religious or even satanic. Shelley, too, also employs Christ-like imagery or themes, even in those poems without a recognised character. Now, it's open to question whether those echoes are less of Jesus Christ specifically and more of the New Testament generally, or indeed whether these allusions are in fact to other poems from previous writers, such as, say, Dante, who themselves had used scripture. Shelley's admiration for Jesus Christ is of course, not without philosophical difficulties or apparent inconsistency. In an incomplete prose piece, alternatively titled On Christianity or Essay on Christianity, likely composed in 1817 alongside Shelley's controversial Leon and Sithna, Shelley describes Jesus as, quote, the being who has influenced in the most memorable manner the opinions and fortunes of the human species. This is the same Shelley who, in 1811, wrote to Thomas Hogg, claiming he could, quote, scarcely set bounds to his hatred of Christianity. Neither is this contradiction easily explained by Shelley simply having changed his mind over the six years. Although Robert Browning famously suggested that had Shelley lived longer, he, quote, would have finally ranged himself for the Christians, as late as April 1822, Shelley wrote to Horace Smith complaining of Lord Byron's delusions of Christianity. Rather than simply altering his opinions and becoming reconciled to Christianity, Shelley found much to admire in the figure and doctrines of Jesus Christ, while importantly remaining dismissive of the religion that bears his name. Both Robert Ryan and David Fuller note how Shelley distinguishes the two with Fuller, in fact, arguing that the theological connotations of the word Christ make it inappropriate in reference to Shelley's Jesus. Shelley, nevertheless, refers to both Jesus and Christ interchangeably throughout his works, and the separation of the man from the religion that bears his name is not always easily achieved. In Ode to Liberty, appearing in the Prometheus Unbound volume, the poet refers to the emergence of Christianity as liberty's enemy, invoking Jesus Christ in the process. When from its sea of death to kill and burn, the Galilean serpent forth did creep and made thy world an undistinguishable heap. While the reference to Galilee recalls the man from Galilee known as Jesus Christ, both um, Donovan et al. and Ryman and Freistadt, so they're editors of, of uh, some of Shelley's poetical editions, read the Galilean serpent as representing the Christian religion rather than Christ explicitly. And it's, if you read the passage from Ode to Liberty, that sense seems to work much better than saying it's Christ. This is, nevertheless, this is in spite of the fact that Jesus the man is nevertheless referred to as a, uh, explicitly referred to as a Galilean in Luke 23, 6. Indeed, the editors of the Longman edition of uh, the poem um, concede that Shelley also uses the term Galilean to disparagingly refer to Jesus in a letter to Hogg, not long after both men have been sent down from Oxford for producing the necessity of atheism. Um, oh, I seem to have missed the slide here. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'll read this out anyway. The Galilean is not a favourite of mine, so far from owing him any thanks for his favours, I cannot avoid confessing that I have a secret grudge to his carpentership. Uh, the reflecting part of his community. Sorry, I cannot avoid confessing that I owe a secret grudge to his carpentership, the reflecting part of the community, that part in whose happiness we have so strong an interest, certainly do not require his morality, which when there is no vice, that is virtue. Here we agree. Let this horrid Galilean rule the canal then. Uh, so uh, there is a slide missing there, so I do apologise for missing that off. Shelley's letter is playful but it nevertheless reveals his seemingly conflicted response to Jesus as well as his own class prejudices. His resignation that, hor that the horrid Galilean should rule over the canal or canals rather, or the masses, is contrasted with his grudging acknowledgement of Jesus's influence on the reflecting part of the community. That this figure can be responsible both for apparently populist bigotry as well as more intellectual contemplation is, is not dissimilar to Shelley's positions on Christ more generally. The phrase Galilean serpent from Ode to Liberty, for instance, draws attention to the historical confounding of Christianity with Jesus Christ. 
If Christianity bears the name of its founder, the figurative expression Galilean serpent simply connects the religion's origins to its founder in a similar fashion. The problem of the association of the good Jesus with corrupt establishment Christianity is most explicitly articulated in the notes to Queen Mab, where Shelley details the two competing conceptions of Jesus Christ's. The first of these is, quote, a hypocritical demon who identifies himself as the God of compassion and peace, even whilst he stretches forth his blood red hand with a sword of discord to waste the earth. And the other who stands in the foremost list of those true heroes who have died in the glorious martyrdom of liberty. The first notion is of the Christ of dogmatic Christian faith, invoked by those Christians who have brought tyranny and abuse of power in Christ's name. The second is Shelley's perception of the historical, good and heroic Jesus, Jesus the man, whose martyrdom and teachings are a positive influence on mankind. In the later Prometheus Unbound, this disjunction between Christ's noble doctrines and the religion that came after is articulated as a lament for the wasted opportunity following Jesus's good works. And I do have this quotation, which I won't read out, but I will refer to it. Jesus's words that survived his death became poisonous as they were corrupted into the faith-based dogma of Christianity, leaving, quote, his mild and gentle ghost wailing for the faith he kindled. Although an initial reading suggests a clear-cut distinction between Jesus's good deeds and the dogmatism of the Christian faith that followed, the last line reads like an accusation or a indictment. Christianity is the faith Jesus kindled, and even if the fire of the modern church is far removed from Jesus' teachings, it was nevertheless Jesus who began or kindled it. Importantly, though, this passage is spoken by the chorus prior to the Furies' torment of Prometheus, an episode I will get to later. The Furies torture Prometheus by showing him the image of the suffering Christ, the purpose being, as Fuller contends, not to show the sufferings of Jesus simply valueless, rather they have been counterproductive, they have given rise to Christianity. In their mockery, the Furies insinuate that Prometheus's fate will be the same. The chorus's words, then, may simply be part of the Furies' tortures, working to exaggerate the culpability of Christ and his poisonous legacy. Even so, it remains difficult for Shelley to completely dissociate Jesus from Christianity in a positive manner. A method Shelley employs in order to attempt this separation, or I like to call it de-Christianization, is by emphasizing Jesus's humanity, often by downplaying, marginalizing, or even dismissing claims for his divinity. While in a letter to Lord Ellenborough, Shelley does not explicitly dismiss the divinity of Jesus, he nevertheless laments how Jesus's divinity and the reportedly supernatural elements surrounding stories of his life are considered as indisputable facts protected by law. And this is the quotation on the slide that I'll be referring to. Shelley's comments here are perfectly worded. While a cursory reading may suggest he is clearly disputing the veracity of miracles and the resurrection, he is in fact only explicitly questioning the lack of free inquiry into religion. The case that, in, that had inspired Shelley to write this, this epistle Daniel Isaac Eaton's 1812 prosecution for blasphemous libel arose from Eaton's publication of a supposed third part of Paine's Age of Reason, Thomas Paine that is. Shelley understood Paine's work to have questioned the divinity of Christ, arguing Paine had challenged the miracles, the resurrection and ascension, and had called the scriptures fable. Shelley's considered tone on this issue here is an act of self-preservation, as it was still technically illegal, and I want to emphasize technically, it was still technically illegal to question the Trinity or to dispute the divinity of Christ. The Doctrine of the Trinity Act, as it's sometimes called, which decriminalized such pronouncements, was not passed until 21st of July, 1813. Even by the time Queen Mab was first published, in which the quoted paragraph ap appears in a note, any comments concerning Christ's divinity could have strayed into illegality. As with a letter to Lord Ellenborough, 1817's On Christianity avoids direct discussion of Jesus's godliness or his supposed supernatural abilities. And uh, again, this is a comment, a uh, quotation I'll refer to. Shelley further, distance, uh, Shelley further distances Jesus's character from the Messiah figure of Christianity arguing that the supposition of Jesus's miracles falsehood or their truth would modify in no degree the hues of the picture which is attempted to be delineated in that essay. 
Whether Jesus is divine or not is irrelevant in considering and learning from his doctrines. Shelley had previously shown interest in separating Jesus's teachings from the trappings of dogmatic Christianity in a letter he wrote to his friend Elizabeth Hitchener on 27th of February 1812, describing his plan to write the now lost biblical extracts. Shelley declared that I have often thought that the moral sayings of Jesus Christ might be very useful if selected from the mystery and immorality that surrounds them. The fulfillment of this desire in on Christianity, therefore, enables the possibility of admiring Jesus without the trappings of the superstition and dogma of the Christian faith and does so without risking prosecution. Although Jesus's humanity is less explicitly asserted and with greater complexity in Shelley's poetry than in his prose, it nevertheless remains an important concern. In Hellas, of, which is a poem of 1822, the chorus referred to Jesus as a power from an, the unknown God, a Promethean conqueror whose mortal shape was like the vapor dim which the Orient planet animates with light. This figure initially seems far from human. He is established as a power sent from God, equated with a mythical titan Prometheus, that might be quite important later, and who sees mortal life as a Venusian vapor, obscuring some greater immortal existence. This is complicated, however, by Shelley's prose notes to the poem, in which he refers to the sublime human character of Jesus Christ. It is important to read this, you know, the sublime human character of, of Jesus Christ, with appropriate emphasis on character and human, uh, oh, sorry, on character rather than the being himself. Whereas Christian theology bestows this sublimity on the man, essentially deifying him, Shelley limits this to Jesus's personal character, the deeds he committed, and his exemplary nature and influence on mankind. This focus on the supposed sublimity on, of Jesus's character and doctrines is something Shelley argues for as early as the notes to Queen Mab, as we can see on this slide. The elevated prophet or sage-like status that Jesus possesses in Hellas does not mean he himself is divine. The light is importantly not located with him and he is not its source. The immortal realm indicated by the Orient planet, which then animates the shape of Jesus's mortal life with light, is also much like the posthumous Christian legacy of Jesus that has backlit, as, as I like to say, Jesus's mortal life and bestowed him with divinity. Having learnt uh, from his earlier dealings with Queen Mab and Leon and Sithna, which I don't talk about a lot in this talk. Um, Shelley wrote to his publisher, Charles Ollier, in November 1821 regarding his new poem, Hellas. If any passages should alarm you in the notes, you are at liberty to suppress them. The poem contains nothing of a tendency to danger. Ollier duly obliged, cancelling passages from the notes, preface, and even the poem itself, despite Shelley's reassurances. Shelley was happy with the publication. If we are to believe a list of errata he sent to Ollier on 11th of April, 1822, he obviously either did not check the proofs carefully or ultimately tolerated the minor redactions from the poem itself. From the preface, which in part detailed the deficiencies of Western European powers in opposing the Turkish oppression of Greece, Ollier removed a paragraph which appeared to support rebellion in England and equated the government with the despot Shelley writes of in the poem itself. Ollier's editing not only protects himself and Shelley from accusations of sedition, but also brings the preface into alignment with the poem's more measured and implied criticism of general tyranny. In addition, not only does Ollier remove the criticisms of the Christian conception of Christ from note eight, he also heavily redacts the penultimate stanza of the poem itself. Um, and here I've emphasized the words that were redacted. Um, Saturn and love, their long repose shall burst, more bright and good than all who fell, than one who rose, than many unsubdued, not gold, not blood, their altered dowers, but votive tears and symbol flowers. In what is a complex passage, both syntactically and thematically, Shelley stresses the apparent superiority of the pagan deities, Saturn and love, over an usurping Christ figure. The structure and sentiment of this passage is similar to that of 1820's Ode to Liberty, in the ode, Shelley sees the height of mankind's liberty to be at the time of Grecian and most particularly Athenian civilization. 
before declining with the rise of Rome and later becoming an undistinguishable heap, which is the passage I quoted earlier, following the rise of Christianity. I mean, it's quite a, dif a fairly difficult passage there. In the notes accompanying this passage in Hellas, Shelley writes, Saturn and love were among the deities of a real or imaginary state of innocence and happiness, and later whimsically adds that the Grecian gods seem indeed to have been personally more innocent, although it cannot be said that as far as temperance and chastity are concerned, they gave so edifying an example as their successor. Shelley here establishes Christianity as the direct and seemingly inferior successor to Grecian paganism, with the result being that Olia removed all allusions to Christianity. Olia also removed the note to the redacted line ending the one who rose, which um, in the notes is glossed, as, is glossed as meaning Jesus Christ, at whose appearance the idols of the pagan world were immersed of their worship. The term immersed indicates anything but a peaceful transvi transition here, with connotations of arbitrary punishment for an offence. The implication is not that one tyrannical religious system is replaced by another that is equally bad, Rather, it is implied that the emergence of vengeful Christianity destroyed innocent paganism and the pagan follows that preceded it. It is not as simple as one religion being preferred to another. What Shelley admires about Grecian paganism is his perception that it is not a religion based on a concrete faith in something literally existent. Whereas Christianity demands tributes of gold and blood, Grecian paganism requires only votive tears and symbol flowers. For Shelley, the attraction of paganism in this sense is that it is self-consciously ceremonial and symbolic rather than dependent on faith-based commitment. After all, in the notes to Queen Mab, he similarly laments how, quote, Christianity inculcates the necessity of supplicating the deity. It is the, ref it is the reification of not only an abstract concept, but a purely symbolic or metaphorical one that Shelley finds most objectionable. While it may simply appear to be this metaphoric or symbolic notion of God that is anthropomorphized and made literal, the penultimate stanza of Hellas reveals a clear conflation of Jesus, the one who rose, with the religion that bears his name. The sublime nature of Jesus's doctrines, his sublime human character, as Shelley puts it in the notes to the poem, have led to the man himself being deified. The acceptance of pagan symbolism over the supposed literalness of Christian faith in Hellas has a curious parallel in the earlier Prometheus Unbound, as the Furies torment Prometheus with an image of the suffering Christ. The Furies instruct Prometheus to behold an emblem, those who do endure deep wrongs for man and scorn and chains, but heap thousandfold torment on themselves and him. For the Furies, the image of the crucified Jesus is an emblem used to break Prometheus's resolve to show that his sufferings, like Christ, that's Prometheus' sufferings, like Christ's sufferings, are in vain. That the crucified Christ is an emblem is suggestive of allegory rather than something literal and sacred. There is an important echo of Book Nine of Wordsworth's The Excursion here when Wordsworth's solitary reflects on the now extinguished gypsy fire that represents the previous day's pleasure. Um, so this is the quotation from book nine, The Excursion. So notice that in that passage I've quoted, it say, he says, behold an emblem. Um, now the Shelley's disappointment with the conservative politics of Wordsworth's poem is well documented with Mary Shelley even writing in her journal in September, 1814, that Wordsworth had become a slave. Percy Shelley's sonnet to Wordsworth of 1816 may be the most famous example of Shelley's grief at the loss of the older poet's youthful radicalism, but the Prometheus Unbound passage can be read in a similar, albeit more hopeful fashion. The Fury's temptation of Prometheus toward despair not only reminds the Titan of how the good work of Jesus has become corrupted by Christianity, the allusion to Wordsworth is to remind the poet that they or their words may similarly become corrupted. This association between poet and mankind's benefactor is explained by Shelley's famous celebration of poets as the, quote, unacknowledged legislators of the world in a defense of poetry, a role um, his Jesus similarly occupies. Uh, he is, Jesus is a poet and an unacknowledged, and uh, therefore an unacknowledged legislator. 
The solitary's reading in Wordsworth's poem, which, and the quotation on the slide, the solitary's reading of the ashes from the gypsy fire as emblematic of past pleasures, however, means the Fury's elusive words offer a hidden, ironically hopeful message. Christ's doctrines, like the earlier words of the now conservative poet Wordsworth, nevertheless retain something of value. As Shelley puts it in a defense of poetry, the poetical doctrines of Christ, quote, outlived the darkness and the convulsions of the epochs that followed. The allusion to Wordsworth, then, is to similarly emphasize how his earlier words may outlive the establishment conservatism that poems such as The Excursion seem to point towards. The passage's depiction of Jesus as emblem, then, that's the uh, Prometheus Unbound passage, uh, directs readers away from literal readings of a divine Christ. Jesus' humanity is similarly emphasized just before this passage, with the onlooking Ione and Panthea discussing what the image is that the Furies present to Prometheus. Jesus is here a mere youth with patient looks, rather than the divine messianic figure of Christian conception. By emphasizing Jesus' vulnerable humanity, Shelley engenders appropriate levels of pathos. This is important both aesthetically and thematically. Although the suggestion is that the immortal Titan Prometheus is to see his own situation in the image of the suffering Christ, there is no indication Ione, Panthea, Prometheus, or even the Furies recognize Jesus as divine. For Robert Ryan, Prometheus' pity for Christ is of, quote, a benefactor of mankind discovering how much he had in common with another. The suggestion that Prometheus identifies himself with Christ is a persuasive one, particularly since the Fury's torments are intended to have him think as much. One crucial difference between the figures is uncovered, however, when Prometheus contemplates the impossibility of his own death following this temptation. Peace is in the grave. The grave hides all things beautiful and good. I am a god and cannot find it there, nor would I seek it. The grave is inaccessible to Prometheus since he is an immortal titan and cannot die, rather different from the human youth fixed to a crucifix. Yet while Jesus' humanity is emphasized and his divinity downplayed, what he shares with Prometheus is his sacrifice for the benefit of all mankind. The sublimity of Jesus' doctrines as stressed in Hellas help in signaling his significance as a human reformist philosopher rather than as embodied divinity. This is precisely what Shelley argues in the earlier On Christianity of 1817. The honour of the human race rests not solely on the achievements of a being concerning whom it is disputed whether it is God or man. It is the profound wisdom and the comprehensive morality of his doctrines which essentially distinguish him from the crowd of martyrs and of patriots who have exalted to devote themselves for what they conceived would contribute to the benefits of their fellow men. Jesus is admired for his benevolent deeds and teaching, with Shelley uh, elsewhere in the essay explicitly referring to him as a reformer three times. The critic Brian Shelley even goes as far as to refer to Shelley's Christ as the Jacobin Jesus. And this view of Christ as a political reformer or revolutionary is, streng is strengthened through Shelley's historicizing of the figure as he places emphasis on the difficult socio-political context of Jesus's lifetime. Now, I won't read this out because it's quite a long quotation. Um, as this long quotation illustrates, Christ Jesus Christ's appearance signaled an attempt to challenge the political status quo and the social ills of his age. This focus on his socio-political situation helps to construe Jesus as a terrestrial human being, temporally fixed in and subject to a specific historical context. Far from seeing Jesus' teaching as irrelevant beyond his time, Shelley's perceived awareness of historical context allows us to move away from the divine and ahistorical Jesus of Christian conception. Establishing Jesus as reacting to the earthly concerns of his day allows Shelley to draw parallels both between Jesus and other reformer figures and between the socio-political context of Jesus' time and Shelley's own. Because of this specific historical emphasis, Shelley is in fact more able to make Jesus' teachings seem relevant and a benefit to a contemporary situation than otherwise offered by traditional Christianity. The ahistorical divine Christ of Christian conception, conflated with a divine and infallible God transcending time, may appear to be applicable to multiple periods and contexts, but he, is, but he in fact speaks to none. He is fixed in temporal permanence. His doctrines, to quote England in 1819, are a book sealed, unavailable 
for reinterpretation. Also, that Christ was accused of blasphemy also enables Shelley to draw a connection to the contemporary blasphemers of his day. Indeed, in the Synoptic Gospels, uh, Jesus's crucifixion was for blasphemy. And Jesus is in fact explicitly accused of this in Matthew 26, 55, Mark 14, 64, and Luke 22, 65. On 2nd of June, 1812, uh, as we've already mentioned this, Lord Ellenborough sentenced Daniel Isaac Eaton, approaching 70 at the time, to 18 months in Newgate prison for his selling and publication of the supposed third part of Paine's Blasphemous, The Age of Reason. In the week prior to this, on 26th of May, Eaton was placed in the prison's pillory for one hour. In Eaton's case, however, far from being pelted with vegetables, rotten fruit and feces, uh, Eaton was showered with cheers of support from a large crowd. And this is reported as such in the examiner. Um, I won't quote the examiner here. Um, not only did Eaton's supporters sell his published narrative of the trial that he had just undertaken, uh, they also distributed other pamphlets. One handbill titled Behold the Man was particularly controversial. As Michael T. Davis notes, since Eaton had been convicted of a blasphemous libel, this bill was particularly daring with its heading an obvious allusion to the biblical instance where Pontius Pilate paraded Christ in a crown of thorns before the Jews, exclaiming, Behold the man. In an indirect and irreverent manner, then, Eaton was comparing himself to Jesus Christ, or at least to his public suffering. The comparison of Eaton to Christ was a practice not limited to Eaton, to Eaton and his followers alone. Not long after his sentence began, Shelley wrote to William Godwin of Eaton's harsh treatment, uh, comparing the motive behind Eaton's punishment, if not his character, to the punishment of Jesus Christ and Socrates. And here's the letter there. Shelley's views led him to begin addressing the public on the subject, resulting in his a letter to Lord Ellenborough. Although predating Queen Mab, the principles expressed remain a key part of much of Shelley's later writing and both the treatment of those convicted or accused of blasphemy, as well as his conception of Christ. In drawing the connection to the blasphemy of Jesus, Shelley's writing reflected much of the discourse and arguments expressed by other writers and commentators of the period. In 1817, a contributor known as um, Homely wrote an article entitled What is Blasphemy in the Unitarian Periodical Monthly Repository of Theology and General Literature, commenting that of this horrid crime, meaning blasphemy, sir, our saviour was frequently accused by the Jews who were so blindly attached to their established church. Similarly, Theophilus Mann, a Quaker writing three years later in the Examiner in 1820, wrote, our blessed Lord himself was charged with blasphemy and suffered for it. Even Lord Byron, who was himself accused of blasphemy for the first five cantos of Don Juan, as well as his play Cain, wrote an 1823 preface to cantos six, seven, and eight of the poem, again invoking the name of Christ, and as with Shelley, Socrates. So I won't read that out, I'll just have it there for reference. Byron, as with Shelley, Homely, and Mann, establishes Jesus Christ as an example of an individual accused of blasphemy, thus discrediting it, discrediting it as a crime, undermining its linguistic power, and essentially exposing it as cant, which is a particularly Byronic concern, of course. The fact that the good Jesus Christ was termed a blasphemer highlights how blasphemy is simply a title that is lavished upon an individual by his or her enemies. It is important, too, that Byron considers this lavished title alongside those of a more ostensibly political nature, such as radical, Jacobin and reformer. In this sense, Jesus and Socrates, as blasphemers, thus become loosely associated with political reform. Nevertheless, while Byron and Shelley are certainly on the same side on this issue, Shelley takes this further. Byron engages in the typical Byronic practice of linguistic demystification without, in this instance, interrogating these terms in full. Um, and this is where he does this. Now, while expressing sympathy for those who are accused of being blasphemers, also suggesting that such persecution is a counterproductive measure in terms of public opinion, this sympathy does not extend to an appraisal of blasphemy, even whether blasphemous opinions are right or wrong. Neither does Byron reflect on Jesus or Socrates as blasphemers beyond the fact that they were so labelled by their enemies. He also does not unpick the relationship between the various lavish titles of blasphemer, Jacobin and reformer. 
Although Shelley's initial response to Eaton's punishment, Daniel Isaac Eaton, that is, as expressed in the letter to Godwin, in which he compares Eaton's sufferings to that of Christ, is simply a rhetorical one similar to Byron's preface, the resulting a letter to Lord Ellenborough offers a far more thorough examination of both blasphemy and of the significance of its relationship to Jesus. Shelley uses the example of Jesus to emphasize the enlightening possibilities of blaspheming and to construct blasphemers as potential political progressives or radicals. A letter to Lord Ellenborough begins simply enough, with Shelley suggesting that Eaton was a victim of a mistrial. Ellenborough had instructed the jury to decide only whether Eaton had indeed published the text or not, without giving them the power to decide whether or not it was blasphemous, in defiance of Fox's Libel Act of 1792. Shelley draws attention to this in a footnote to a question challenging the verdict's constitutionality. Wherefore did not you, my lord, check such unconstitutional pleading and desire the jury to pronounce the accused innocent or criminal? A key aspect of Shelley's defence of Eaton, though, is on the question of religious difference, with Shelley arguing that his prosecution resulted from simple religious disagreement between Eaton the deist and Ellenborough the Christian. Um, the analogy Shelley draws here in this quotation, which I won't read out again, um, the analogy Shelley draws here between Ellenborough's actions and the persecutors of early Christianity reflects many of the arguments presented in periodicals of the time. An article uh, appearing in the Examiner in 1818, for instance, similarly reframes blasphemy accusations as resulting from simple disagreement. Take two men of irritable mould, set them a talking about God and thence necessarily about his attributes. The moment any difference of opinion is placed between them and that moment will never be far distant, each becomes in the eyes of the other a blasphemer. To each it therefore becomes clear that the other ought to be punished. Uh, Theophilus Mann, writing a couple of years later in 1820 in the same publication, establishes blasphemy prosecutions to simply be an example of the dominant law protected sect persecuting minority religious groups. Rulers may, may take cognizance of the conduct of men who break the laws, who unlawfully speak against or ill-treat the persons of their fellow men. But if they are allowed to punish men for anything so indefinite as is the word blasphemy, what sect shall be safe, except the sect which happens to be established by law? At one period, the world charged us, meaning the Quakers, with blasphemy. The Jews have often been so reviled, and thou knowest that the Unitarians have laboured under the same heavy imputations. The like foolish charge was brought by the heathens against the early Christians and by the Roman Catholics against our Protestant reformers, and thus thou seest the charge goes round. The listing of successive religious minorities who have been persecuted by the dominant religion as blasphemers, emphasising how the charge goes round, mirrors Shelley's comments concerning how prevailing religious opinion is rooted in a specific historical context, having simply superseded that which went before. Although Shelley says he means not to compare Mr. Eaton with Socrates or Jesus, what Eaton and Shelley's Jesus do share is that both were punished for opposing the established religion or prevailing religious opinion of their respective eras. Shelley's arguments here are central to his thinking on Christ's teachings, and he reuses and develops these in his notes to Queen Mab. Jesus Christ was crucified because he attempted to supersede the ritual of Moses with something more moral and humane. His very judge made public acknowledgement of his innocence, but a bigoted and ignorant mob demanded the deed of horror. Barabbas, the murderer and traitor, was released. The meek reformer Jesus was immolated to the sanguinary deity of the Jews. Time rolled on, time changed the situations, and with them the opinions of men. Christianity is now the established religion. He who attempts to disprove it must behold murderers and traitors take precedence of him in public opinion. Though, if his genius be equal to his courage, and assisted by a peculiar coalition of circumstances, future ages may exalt him to a divinity, and persecute others in his name, as he was persecuted in the name of his predecessor in the homage of the world. Shelley's reference to the mutability of opinions over time echoes Thomas Paine's comment in the first part of Rights of Man that the circumstances of the world are continually changing, and the opinions of men change also. Christianity has become for Shelley the very institutional religion that Jesus came to reform and is clearly established as distinct from the Old Testament or Jewish conception of God. And those are uh, Shelley's words, not mine, Jew Jewish conception of God. His death is imagined, in fact, as a sacrifice to this very God in being immolated to the sanguinary de deity of the Jews. The exaltation of this martyred figure of Christ to a divinity 
punished and persecuted for blaspheming the religious opinion of the day, leads in turn to the emergence of a faith that engages in the very persecution that ended the life of its founder. Although Shelley does not dwell too much in Eaton's own religious opinions, besides noting he's a deist and a victim of, of Christian persecution, Shelley's Jesus is established as a reformer figure, clearly intent on superseding the old Mosaic code, meaning the, the code of Moses, rather than simply defying it. This is an important aspect of his later writings on Jesus as seen both in Queen Mab, but most particularly in On Christianity. There is also a clear political there is sorry, <clears throat> there is also a clear political dimension in this stance, summed up by John Archer's suggestion that the old Mosaic Code, both for Shelley and Shelley's Jesus, was, quote, one of the models for tyranny because it exemplifies a completely contingent positive law posing as divine law. The supposed infallibility of political and priestly power is precisely what Jesus came to reveal as false, thus offering a firm challenge to hierarchy and hegemony. This challenge is closely connected to Shelley's Jesus's idea of God, which is one far removed from both Old Testament and contemporary Christian conception. Contemporary meaning 19th century Christian conception. Jesus's God for Shelley is one more is one that's much more akin to the power as seen in poems such as Mont Blanc and Hymn to Intellectual Beauty. As Shelley writes in On Christianity, it is important to observe that the author of the Christian system had a conception widely differing from the gross imaginations of the vulgar relative to the ruling power of the universe. In particular, Shelley is at pains to stress that Jesus' God is not an anthropomorphic deity subject to passion, but is instead an indefinable power mysteriously and eliminatively pervading the frame of things. Shelley adds, according to Jesus Christ, God is neither the Jupiter who sends rain upon the earth, nor the Venus through whom, who, through whom all living things are produced. Rather, the word God, according to the accept, uh, acceptation of Jesus Christ, is the interfused and overruling spirit of all the energy and wisdom included within the circle of existing things. The reference to Jupiter is, of course, particularly significant in relation to Prometheus Unbound. For now, the way this understanding of God is highlighted as a challenge to existing political power is made evident in Shelley's reading of Jesus's teaching concerning spiritual fulfillment. Shelley interprets Matthew 5, 8, which is blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God, um, as referring to those who, quote, have preserved internal sanctity of soul, are the same in act as they are in desire, and who are faithful and sincere witnesses before the tribunal of their own judgment of all that passes within their mind. In contrast to Queen Mab, where Christianity is seen to necessitate supplicating the deity, the true teaching of Jesus renounced the necessity of devotion to a monarchical God. This is clearly seen in Shelley's understanding of Jesus' philosophy of spiritual attainment before death. And I won't read that out, it's just there for reference. This is in Queen Mab. Here, Shelley distances Jesus from the teaching that good deeds are rewarded after death, through deference to and at the good grace of a kingly God. This God is very much the one of Queen Mab, described as prototype of human misrule, who sits high in heaven's realm upon a golden throne, even like an earthly king. Explicitly dismissing the notion of God as a king and a monarch from Jesus' teachings, Shelley also describes this God as paternal, emphasizing the triple connection between patriarchal, political, and religious tyranny. Elsewhere in the essay, Shelley determines his determines Jesus to have been a figure working towards, quote, the abolition of artificial distinctions among mankind, and his doctrine of universal love, in which you ought not to love the individuals of domestic circle less, but to love those who exist beyond it more, is seen to make distinctions of property and power vanish. Now, you can certainly observe a bit of William Godwin in that. Jesus is therefore less a fulfillment of messianic prophecy and more a political radical, attacking political and social hierarchy by revealing the arbitrariness of social distinctions. At the heart of social inequality for Shelley is the malign influence of the one, uh, sorry, one shape of many names that we get in Leon and Sithna, representative of the amorphous corrupt power of which of a monarchical and kingly god is its clearest exemplar. Shelley's Jesus' dismissal of such a figure is therefore not solely theological, but has significant political implications. Key to the dismissal of an anthropomorphized God is Shelley's Jesus's opposition to the vengeful God of the Old Testament, a being who inflicts suffering on his enemies. Shelley writes, 
The absurd and execrable doctrine of vengeance seems to have been contemplated in all its shapes by this great moralist, Jesus Christ, with the profoundest disappropriation. Nor would he permit the most venerable of names, meaning God, to be, to be perverted into a section for the meanest and most contemptible propensities incident to the nature of man. Christians have misrepresented Jesus' conception of this figure, noting how Jesus' teachings concerning God's benevolence are at odds with the eternal punishment of non-Christians and sinners beyond death. God's perfection for, Sh for Shelley's Jesus is based in, in uh, refraining from vengeance and retribution. Jesus Christ instructed his disciples to be perfect as their father in heaven is perfect, declaring at the same time his belief that human perfection required the refraining from revenge or retribution in any of its various shapes. The perfection of the human and the divine character is thus asserted to be the same. Man, by resembling God, fulfills most accurately the tendencies of his nature, and God comprehends within itself all that constitutes human perfection. Thus, God is a model through which the excellence of man is to be measured, whilst the abstract perfection of the human character is the actual perfection of the divine. Since this God is merely an abstract exemplar of human perfection, he is not a real anthropomorphic being, and his apparent vengefulness does not correspond with the human perfection that Jesus' doctrines teach humanity to attain. The perfect human for Shelley's Jesus, and therefore the one who is closest to God, is essentially one who turns the other cheek. As Lee Hunt claimed for, quote, his Christianity, Shelley went to the Gospel of St. James and to the Sermon on the Mount by Christ himself. Shelley, in fact, misquotes part of this sermon from Matthew 5, 54 to 45 in his On Christianity. Jesus's message in the Sermon on the Mount is one that challenges the notion of like for like punishment or the eye for eye, tooth for tooth doctrine in the Old Testament. Punishment in the Old Tes Testament for Shelley is to be done not because it is supposed, and the supposition would be sufficiently detestable, that the moral nature of the sufferer would be improved by his tortures. It is done because it is just to be done. My neighbor or my servant or my child has done me an injury, and it is just that he should suffer an injury in return. Such is the doctrine which Jesus Christ summoned his whole resources of persuasion to oppose. Although Shelley concedes that the Old Testament understanding of punishment does not imply that suffering is morally improving, there is nevertheless the implication that it becomes a just act if a punishment for sin. It is this that Jesus opposes for Shelley, and it is an attitude that helps explain Shelley's interest in the book of Job, as recorded by Mary Shelley in her, in her notes to his The Revolt of uh, Sorry, as recorded by Mary Shelley in her notes to his The Revolt of Islam in her edition of his poems of 1839. As Fuller explains, the book of Job, uh, this interest in the book of Job was because it represented an attack on other Old Testament wisdoms which affirm a theology of just suffering. Despite Jesus' teaching to the contrary, Shelley's perception of the Christianity um, of his day is of a religion that, that not only perpetuates the notion of just suffering as punishment for sin, but is in fact a religion preoccupied with suffering. This is not just because of its historical persecution of blasphemers or unbelievers, but because its key belief in Christ's crucifixion and his atonement for mankind's sins predicates Christianity on a single event of immense physical suffering. This is a view that has persisted in the contemporary role with commentators such as Jack Miles describing the crucifix as a violently obscene icon that Elaine Scarry sees as having become the primary sign and summary of the entire religion. The violent image of a man nailed to a cross has become more than just a mere symbol of remembrance of Christ's sacrifice, but in Christianity's entire summation, far more than the simple emblem of Prometheus Unbound. The connection drawn between the pain of the crucifixion and the persecution of religious outsiders is made evident, if a little tongue-in-cheek is worth noting, in Shelley's epistolary poem, Letter to Mariah Gisborne, which is 1820. In a passing reference to the Spanish Inquisition, echoing to the Iberian priest of the revolt of Islam, the poet considers the tortures that would have been committed by the Inquisition in the name of Christ, hoping to convert English Protestants had the Armada of 1588 succeeded. And this is an example of it here. Shelley is doing more than simply noting the atrocities carried out in Christ's name here, however, and in fact draws together three seemingly disparate threads, as well as listing the instruments used to inflict suffering on those the Inquisition hopes to convert in the final line, the poet considers this physical earthly torture to be a, quote, faint foretaste of damnation, to which, in Christian doctrine, sinners and non-believers are subject after death. 
The reference to torture as a means of paying some interest for the debt owed to Jesus Christ for their salvation, though, is a particularly provocative critique of a key aspect of Christian doctrine. Not only is Christianity predicated on Christ's crucifixion, an event of physical suffering, such a misplaced focus gives rise to the perceived tyranny of historical Christianity. The idea of paying a debt may seem curiously vengeful, but the fixation on the suffering body of Christ also serves to embody abstract notions of divinity within the flesh of a man. Since Christian salvation is predicated on the celebration or commemoration of an act of torture for Shelley, it is inevitability that the religion's followers would themselves become persecutory. Prometheus Unbound, a drama concerning the sacrifice and suffering of its protagonist, is Shelley's attempt to stage a revolution like the one begun by Jesus Christ, but without making the same mistakes in Christianity. In Hellas, if we remember, Christ is described as a Promethean conqueror. And it is easy to see how Prometheus, in Prometheus Unbound, indeed shares attributes with Jesus Christ. Not only are Prometheus's epiphanies and his peaceful resistance easily paralleled with the teachings of Shelley's Jesus, Prometheus Unbound's socio-political and philosophical themes are certainly analogous to those encountered in Shelley's other works. Prometheus Unbound, while containing quote, numerous strains of atheist thought and imagery, nevertheless has been read as possessing a curiously religious purpose. The poet W.B. Yeats said of the work, after having read it for the first time in a number of years, that, quote, it seems to me to have an even more certain place than I had thought among the sacred books of the world. Yeats's comment here is more than simple appreciative melodramatic praise. As Alan Gregory puts it, Prometheus Unbound works as a piece of revisionist scripture. Despite Shelley's aversion to didactic poetry, Prometheus Unbound is decidedly instructive. Much of it is proclamation, and it ends in the mode of sermonic exhortation. It appears that humanity cannot do without scripture, and Shelley has set about writing a new one, the authority of which, because it is in harmony with human hope, good, and destiny, requires no threatenings. This new gospel, Gregory goes on to say, is a reworking of the Christian virtues of faith, hope and love, in which in which Shelley, quote, ransacks the imagery of biblical hope and Christian salvation to create his humane atheist vision. It would be more precise, however, to say that it is the doctrines of Christ specifically, rather than the Christian religion more broadly, that Shelley ransacks as he attempts to move beyond the trappings of corrupt Christianity and to connect with the benevolent humanist and reformist sentiments of Jesus the man. The classical source material and allegorical style of Prometheus Unbound meant it did not suffer the same legal or censorious attention as Queen Mab or Leon and Sithna, but it is nevertheless easy to discern where it may have run into trouble. As Brian Shelley has pointed out, the eponymous character is a titan to whom Shelley ascribes both Christ-like and diabolical characteristics. The association of Christ with Satan certainly risks offence, but it's important to note that these diabolical characteristics are those of Milton's Satan rather than the antagonist of Christian myth. Indeed, although Prometheus Unbound is based on the drama of Aeschylus, that's Aeschylus's Prometheus Bound and the lost Prometheus Unbound, that is, uh, several biblical and Miltonic sources have a bearing on the opening act. Um, so Shelley writes about this in the opening to his preface. I won't read this out because it's, uh, it's quite well known. Um, Shelley does not highlight Prometheus' sim similarity to Jesus in the pref preface, and the Titan is comparable to Satan only up to a point. Shelley is no different to other romantic poets, such as Blake, in identifying Satan as the hero of Paradise Lost. However, he remains a flawed character whose personal ambition, hubris, and crucially, desire for revenge um, make him a poor exemplar of heroic resistance to seemingly omnipotent tyranny. By contrast, Shelley's Prometheus is a superior example because he eventually comes to resist Jupiter's tyranny through humility and without resorting to revenge or personal ambition. For Peter A. Shock, Prometheus's Satanism aligns him with the politically charged satanic figures associated by their choice or otherwise, with political radicals of the 1790s. At the same time, Shelley's anxiety of the violence suggested by such a figure necessitates a softening of him. As Shock contends, this explains Shelley's compounding of his satanic Prometheus with the Prometheus of Aeschylus. 
A further necessary mythic source for Shelley's Prometheus, I argue, is the peaceful, non-vengeful Jesus Christ. The drama, like Paradise Lost, begins in Medeus Res, with Prometheus bound to a precipice in the Caucasus and his opening speech echoing Milton's Satan. Not only is it in blank verse and situated after the initial apparent defeat of the protagonist, there are also clear thematic echoes of Satan's equivalent opening speech in Milton's poem. Monarch of gods and demons and all spirits but one who throng these bright and rolling worlds, which thou and I alone of living things behold with sleepless eyes, regard this earth made multitudinous with thy slaves whom thou requitest for knee worship, prayer and praise and toil and hecatums of broken hearts with fear and self-contempt and barren hope. Description of Jupiter here appears to be, as Timothy Webb notes, shaped in part at least by the Jehovah whom Shelley and Shelley's Jesus encountered in the Old Testament. Shelley indeed uses the very name of Jupiter, as we saw in his essay on Christianity, to describe a figure that is most unlike the God described by Jesus. Jupiter has made slaves of the world, and like the Christian requirement of supplicating the deity, as seen in poems such as Queen Mab, demands knee worship from his subjects. Prometheus's depiction of Jupiter's omnipotence, however, is not one that determines Jupiter's de facto reality. Instead, Prometheus establishes this as a facade or a manufactured omnipotence fabricated by Jupiter's tyranny. Prometheus is the one who Jupiter does not control and with sleepless eyes sees Jupiter's power for what it is. This defiance of seemingly omnipotent power is similarly central to Satan's opening speech of Paradise Lost, in which he refers to the tyranny of heaven and scorns God de God's demands with supplication. So I've uh, highlighted that bit from Paradise Lost here. The very suppliant worship of God is what deifies him. Although Satan notes how God militaristically proved, the stronger proved with his thunder, his claim that his rebellion led to battles in heaven that shook God's throne suggests that God's power is not infallible and can be challenged. The sun, eh, the sun from Paradise Lost, however, later reveals that Satan did not in fact trouble God's position, revealing that Satan is lying in his first speech. Milton's deity, is therefore understood to be genuinely omnipotent, unlike the aspirational false omnipotence of Shelley's Jupiter. There are also two key differences between Satan and Prometheus. The first is Satan's uh, um, infamous hubris. His distaste to having to bow, bow down to God is because of his personal ignominy and shame. It is a stand therefore made not on behalf of others, but one born of his personal egoism and ambition. The second difference lies with his methods, shown by his actions throughout Paradise Lost and his motivation for continuing his resistance to God. Satan's will and firm resistance is based on his hatred for God and desire for revenge. This is in stark contrast to Prometheus, who, despite the severe torture at Jupiter's hands, loses his hatred and begins, in fact, to feel pity. I won't read the whole of this out, I'll just read the bottom bit. Disdain, ah, no, I pity thee. What ruin will hunt thee undefended through the wide heaven? How will thy soul cloven into its depth with terror, gape like a hell within? I speak in grief, not exultation, for I hate no more as then, ere misery made me wise. The curse once breathed in thee, I would recall. For many critics, this early passage is nevertheless the crucial turning point of the poem, depicting, as Stuart Sperry puts it, the hero's change of heart from hatred toward love. For Ronald Dirksen, Prometheus', Prometheus success in the drama is the sudden realisation of his own moral failure in his earlier disdaining of Jupiter, enabling Prometheus to articulate pity for his tormentor. In spite of his tortures, Prometheus patiently waits for the hour in which Jupiter shall fall, rather than violently seeking his downfall. He declares that he will hate no more and wishes to recall the curse he levelled. In defeat, Jupiter is to kiss the blood from these pale feet, which, if they did not disdain such a prostate slave, would trample him. This is not a threat of physical domination by Prometheus. Rather, the battle against Jupiter is one of Blakean mental fight. The image of pale feet covered in blood importantly recalls Christ on the cross, although Brian Shelley sees these lines as echoing an Old, Old Testament reference of the Psalms 2.12. Despite being bound and seemingly defeated, Prometheus senses victory. This victory and defeat is encountered in another romantic treatment of the Prometheus myth, Byron's poem Prometheus, where the protagonist is praised for being able to make death a victory. The concept of a victory in or over death is commonly associated with the Christian doctrine of Christ's resurrection. 
Prometheus's eventual achievement in Shelley's drama, then, is obtained more through his Christ-like rather than his satanic qualities. In Prometheus Unbound, the apparent victor, Jupiter, is the real loser. Following his torture and torment at the hands of Furies, Prometheus declares, Though dread revenge, this is defeat, fierce king, not victory. Jupiter's torture of Prometheus as punishment for his rebellion is self-defeating and is a mirror to the vengeful violence of bloody revolution. As Prometheus declares, the sights with which thou torturest gird my soul with new endurance. That this episode follows Prometheus's final temptation at the hands of the Furies is significant. Sorry, the bit I've just quoted, not the bit on the slide. To reiterate, the Furies torture Prometheus by showing the image of the suffering Christ, as we've seen, with the implication being that Prometheus', Prometheus sufferings are to lead to a similar outcome and the establishment of a tyrannical faith system. Despite the benevolent example of Jesus as the final Furious king to remind Prometheus, mankind has remained far from his example. In each human heart, terror survives the ravine it has gorged, the loftiest fear all that, that they would disdain to think were true. Hypocrisy and custom make their minds the fanes of many a worship, now outworn. They dare not devise good for man's estate, and yet they know not that they do not dare. The good want power, but to weep barren tears. The powerful goodness want, worse need for them. The wise want love, and those who love want wisdom. And all best things are thus confused to ill. Many are strong and rich, and would be just, but live among their suffering fellow men as if none felt. They know not what they do. These evils, the Fury notes, are unheard, unseen, lying within the heart of man. Yet in this final temptation to despair, as it's often referred to, the Fury crucially echoes Jesus' forgiving words on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's from Luke 23, 34. Many critics have interpreted this Fury's echo of Christ as deliberate. It is a mocking, cruel irony, or as Timothy Webb puts it, an attempt to catch Prometheus in an imprisoning negative or as an example of historical nihilism. Significantly, however, this temptation to despair is a failure. It is this very line, they know not what they do, the final line of the final temptation that essentially ensures Prometheus's victory. Thy words are like a cloud of winged snakes, and yet I pity those they torture not. Thou pitiest them, I speak no more. The fact that Prometheus immediately turns to pity after the echo of Christ's line is striking. While the fury intends this illusion to mock the futility of Jesus' sufferings, Prometheus recognises Jesus' words an exemplary and supreme act of forgiveness. The fury's listing of humanity's faults, punctuated with Christ's inspirational words, in fact creates hope and new endurance within Prometheus. If humanity is unaware of its failings, since they know not what they do, this allows for the possibility of future change. Mankind can be taught the error of its ways and change for the better. From a position of apparent victory, Jupiter's torments by his furies sow the seeds of his defeat. Like the furies' earlier echo of Wordsworth's The Excursion, intended to tempt Prometheus to despair, the illusion in fact reminds the poet or Prometheus of the value of the words echoed and is in fact encouraged to, to seek inspiration where he can. Prometheus had to himself learn forgiveness by revoking the curse he placed on Jupiter. In his opening speech, as we remember, Prometheus wishes the curse once breathed in thee I would recall. The term recall means both remembering the curse, but also revoking it with recall and revoke possessing a shared etymology. The repeat of the curse by Jupiter's phantasm later in the act reveals that this revocation, as the term suggests, necessitates a revoicing. The sufferings wished upon Jupiter importantly allude to both Jesus and Milton's Satan. But thou who art the God and Lord, O thou who fillest with thy soul this world of woe, to whom all things of earth and heaven do bow in fear and worship, all prevailing foe, I curse thee. Let a sufferer's curse clasp thee, his torture like remorse till thine infinity shall be a robe of envenomed agony, and thine omnipotence a crown of pain to cling like burning gold round thy dissolving brain. Heap on thy soul by virtue of this curse, ill deeds then be thou damned beholding good. The final lines, of course, echo Satan's refrain in Paradise Lost, evil be thou my good, um, as well as other passages. Satan's wish to turn good to evil is echoed by Prometheus' curse of Jupiter that seemingly views good and evil, as I mentioned. 
Prometheus's curse is a vengeful and self-pitying one. He claims that because he is a sufferer, his sufferer's curse becomes that more powerful. This essentially encapsulates a doctrine of revenge and just suffering that Prometheus must and does learn to repudiate. The image of the crown of pain and the robe of envenomed agony, importantly leveled at Jupiter, recall Christ's crown of thorns and the scarlet robe of the passion. So look at Luke 23, 11 and Matthew 27, 28. Um, this allusion is significant. Um, at this point in the play, as Timothy Webb notes, uh, Prometheus and Jupiter are identified. It is therefore entirely appropriate that when Prometheus asks to hear the curse which he once invoked on Jupiter, the words of that curse are spoken by the phantasm of Jupiter himself. Prometheus cannot recall them since he has now cast out hatred, but the phantasm is more than, than an ironical dramatic advice. Its appearance actually suggests that in cursing Jupiter, Prometheus became identified with him. Prometheus's vengeful curse, symbolic of political revolutionary violence, is of the same sentiment that leads to the replacement of one tyrant for another. In cursing and wishing pain upon Jupiter, Prometheus becomes the very being he opposes. Indeed, Webb sees Prometheus Unbound as a critique of violent revolution, the crude instinct to hit back as soon as one is hurt, a reaction which will only help to perpetuate the meaningless cycle of violence that was observed in the failure of the French Revolution. The fact that the imagined sufferings of Jupiter resemble Christ's is a similar reminder of how good is turned to ill. To, to pay a debt for the sufferings of Christ is to be identified with his murderers and serves to identify him with the deity he opposed, the very deity whose followers put him to death. Like the rebel Prometheus's potential to become a new tyrant, the benevolent doctrines of Jesus Christ have become perverted into a bigoted faith system. In Prometheus's original voicing of the curse, then, he knew not what he did. Hearing the curse again, Prometheus is able to learn of his error and repents. It doth repent me. Words are quick and vain. Grief for a while is blind, and so was mine. I wish no living thing to suffer pain. While Prometheus was previously blind or eyeless in hate, he has now seen the error of his ways. The rhyming of pain with vain underscores Prometheus's rejection of a doctrine of just suffering, as if all acts of violence are inevitably misguided and useless. The revocation of the curse ensures that Prometheus does not become the new embodied deity and political tyrant. In fact, none of the characters take power at all. This is an essential element of the drama, asserting the play's philosophy of the corrupting influence of power. For Stuart Sperry, Prometheus represents an odd kind of hero. He is peculiarly passive and does not actively work to enact chains and serves sim simply as the medium for it. It is in fact Demogorgon, for instance, who finally overthrows Jupiter, while Prometheus relies on Hercules to free him from his bonds. Prometheus is instead Prometheus only a link in a larger chain of causality, recalling Shelley's doctrine of necessity. Although Sperry is dismissive of critical attempts to convert Prometheus into a Christ figure virtue from the opening of the play, he is thinking more of the Christian Christ rather than the Jesus of Shelley's conception. Shelley's Jesus is, after all, simply a man and not the messianic divine hero of Christianity. Jesus does not single-handedly enact the changes or reforms he preaches for Shelley, and neither does his crucifixion entail supernatural power serving to atone for man's sins. The implication of Sperry's argument is that Prometheus does not embody a form of divine salvation within himself. Instead, he is simply an aspect of this change or its medium through which transformation works to influence others. To see Prometheus as like Shelley's Jesus, then, is to actually help support Sperry's position. <clears throat> Excuse me. The drama achieves the desired removal of Jupiter from power without enshrining a new power in his stead. For Earl R. W Wasserman, Prometheus Unbound ridicule ridicules Christianity's belief that the Godhead can be embodied. Alongside this, it also mocks the Christian doctrine of the incarnation. It is worth noting, for instance, that Demogorgon, or people monster, the agent by whom Jupiter is overthrown, is not an embodied and physical being. Upon first encountering Demogorgon, Panthea says, I see a mighty darkness filling the seat of power and rays of gloom dart round as light from the meridian sun, ungazed upon and shapeless, yet we feel it is a living spirit. Demogorgon, then, is not only like Milton's death, if shape it might be called, that shape had none distinguishable in member, but also the awful power of him to intellectual beauty and Mont Blanc that is unseen yet still present. It is a non-deity and non-physical essence. The defeat of Jupiter by this non-embodied power is not only a political revolution, therefore, but also a philosophical and religious one.
It represents a challenge to the perceived divinity and omnipotence of a monarchical and anthropomorphized god. At Jupiter's defeat by Demogorgon, as he realizes Demogorgon's power, Jupiter begs for mercy. I won't read that out, I'll just have it for your reference. This on the slide alludes to Satan's appeals to Christ in Paradise Regained. Satan, fearing the tyranny and vengeance of God, hopes the new reign of the sun would stand between me and his father's ire. Jupiter here, like Satan with the sun, recognizes the power of Prometheus's Christ-like forgiveness and mercy. As a result, Jupiter's earlier declaration, I am omnipotent, is proven to be false. While it is Prometheus who resembles Satan at the play's opening, it is Jupiter who most re resembles Milton's antagonist by the third act here. This shared likeness may associate the victim with his persecutor, but also helps remind us what Prometheus would have become had he followed his more satanic rather than Christ-like instincts. Jupiter, by contrast, is the corrupt, vengeful Satan of Paradise Regained, rather than the more heroic Satan of Paradise Lost Book One. Jupiter is unable to compre comprehend that there should be no ruler following his defeat, asking whether Prometheus is the monarch of the world. As Demogorgon replies, however, the tyranny of heaven none may retain or reassume or hold succeeding thee. Demogorgon and Prometheus' revolution, therefore, is one that enshrines no anthropomorphized power in Jupiter's stead. For Shelley, this idealized revolution is precisely the opposite of what occurred in mainstream Christianity's conception of Christ. Jesus' reforming words and example have not only failed to inspire humanity fully for the better, but they have led to the perception of Jesus as God, uh, sorry, have led to the perception of Jesus as God or power incarnate. He becomes, therefore, the physical embodiment of the very power structure he sought to oppose. Wasserman emphasizes issues of, of embodiment or incarnation as central to the drama, again asserting the association of Prometheus with Jesus. He says, to Shelley, Christ is the highest form of mind in the realm of being, not the personification of power. If Shelley's Jesus reveals the falsity of an anthropomorphic God, that does not mean he is God in its place. This connection between Jupiter, Jupiter and Prometheus and God and Jesus is more than simply analogous or inferred, since the issue of Jesus' physical embodiment is a key part of the Fury Torment scene. Upon being shown the image of the suffering Jesus, as we've already seen, Prometheus says, Remit the anguish of that lighted stare, close those one lips, let that thorn-wounded brow stream not with blood, it mingles with thy tears, fix, fix those tortured orbs in peace and death, so thy sick throes shake not that crucifix, so those pale fingers play not with thy gore, O oh, horrible, thy name I will not speak, it hath become a curse. Prometheus may simply be shielding his eyes from the horrific suffering of Jesus on the cross, yet the successive negatives become imperatives. Not only, it seems, are they aimed at Jesus, but those who follow him. While these negatives are certainly sympathetic, Prometheus wishes peace and death upon Jesus, so his sufferings continue not. They are also a call to end the fixation um, and focus on Jesus's physical body. In particular, the call for Jesus to shake not that crucifix, so those pale fingers play not with thy gore, not only alludes to Macbeth's, uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth's command to Banquo's ghost, but also the appearance of Jesus before his disciples following the resurrection in John 20, 19, the, which is the so-called Doubting Thomas episode. I won't really get into depth there. The episode, uh, the Doubting Thomas episode, that is, forms part of the then nascent Christian doctrine of Jesus as God, and thus God incarnate, embodied in a physical shape. Prometheus' unbound allusion to and subsequent dismissal of this episode is a challenge to the doctrine of Christ as anthropomorphized salvation. Uh, by attempting not to focus on Jesus' wounds and physical body, Prometheus downplays the doctrine of atonement for sin, suggesting instead that any positive influence of Jesus be confined to his good deeds and teachings. Like Sperry's conception of Prometheus' heroism, this Jesus does not himself bring about the change or salvation he preaches. He is simply the first expression of change, serving as its necessary catalyst rather than embodying it within himself. Not only does Prometheus call for a movement away from the fixation of the physical Jesus, Prometheus also avoids calling him by name. Thy name I will not speak. It hath become a curse. In fact, the name Jesus Christ does not appear in Prometheus Unbound at all. Prometheus' aversion to naming Jesus aligns with Shelley's broader scepticism of nomenclature, as I uh, argue elsewhere. By refusing to name him, Prometheus can disassociate Jesus Christ from the religion that bears his name. Moreover, the fact that this name has become a curse is not only suggestive of blasphemous swearing, but also refers back to Prometheus's recently revoked curse of Jupiter. Not only did Prometheus' curse allude to Jesus' sufferings, Jesus did indeed therefore become a curse, 
but it threatened to turn Prometheus into the very tyrant he opposed. Parallel with the possible result of Prometheus' opposition to Jupiter, then, Jesus' opposition, <clears throat> Jesus's opposition did lead to the creation of a tyrannical faith in his name. This is because the curse of his name was never revoked. Prometheus' victory in the drama is one that avoids the establishment of a vengeful, persecuting faith system. Alan Gregory's suggestion that Prometheus Unbound is a piece of revisionist scripture ending with a sermonic exhortation is borne out by Demogorgon's speech at the close of the drama. And this is, my, this is where I'm finishing here, so don't worry. To suffer woes which hope thinks infinite, to forgive wrongs darker than death or night, to defy power which seems omnipotent, to love and bear, to hope, till hope creates from its own wreck the thing it contemplates, neither to change, nor falter, nor repent. This, like thy glory, Titan, is to be good, great, and joyous, beautiful, and free. This is alone life, joy, empire, and victory. Demogorgon's message of love, forgiveness, and endurance reflects the qualities of Jesus. Where this differs from Christian doctrine, however, is the absence of faith, with greater emphasis stressed on the more applicably secular hope. This victory is crucially not achieved through Prometheus himself, but the practice of individuals. Such behavior is like Prometheus's glory, but it is distinct from him. In this way, Demogorgon avoids the development of a faith system in Prometheus's name, as it is not in supplication to this figure that one is to succeed. Rather, it is in emulating his example. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, um, thank you, Paul, on what uh, is a very loaded and dense lecture. And I'm sure that uh, it would uh, take us a bit of time to uh, mull over the whole thing. Um, Absolutely. I now would uh, request uh, Assistant Professor Mr. Tonmoy Kundu to uh, take over for a while and uh, see if anyone has, yeah, right. Shubhasri has uh, put this question. So, uh, Paul, I guess you can, uh, you know, see it on your screen. Uh, yep. Should I read that out or can you see it? I can see that, yep. Um, if Jesus can you listen to that. Yes, that's quite an interesting point. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's a really good point. I think um, uh, there there has been some writing on. Um, I think the crucial point, I suppose, to answer you, uh, answer the question is the sense that is the, the emphasis on unacknowledged. Um, although poets sort of write laws, uh, as it were, um, they are then crucially unacknowledged. I think that I suppose the problem with with Christ or the Christian conception of Christ for Shelley is that it's become he's become sort of too acknowledged. He's become too solidified, really. Um, <clears throat> I suppose that's that's what I'm getting. I mean, when Shelley is writing, there is quite an interesting change in legislation. For instance, uh, there's a greater toleration towards um, Unitarianism, which doesn't recognize the divinity of Christ, for instance. Um, and that sort of starts to come in in the early 19th century. Um, but yes, it's, it's, but that, that's, that's kind of what I would say. How does the, so Christ is, a, is um, I suggested he was like an unacknowledged legislator, or Jesus rather, is like an unacknowledged legislator because he's like a poet. Um, uh, Shelley refers to Christ's poetical doctrines. Right, so um, that's kind of what I was uh, referring to. I hope that makes sense. I well, hope it does. Uh, Donmo, is there any other questions slash observation? Well, as uh, today is the night before Diwali, and you may have heard of Diwali, which is a very big festival in India. Mm -hmm. So. I uh, we haven't had the, the expected number of people joining in, but the talk is recorded on YouTube, so they can uh, listen to it later, and it would require a bit of attentive listening to, uh, mm. because this is something that is, uh, as I was uh, mentioning, very intense and dense. Um, so thank you, thank you a lot for this, uh, and as uh, it had taken us a bit of time to um, arrange this, uh, arrange this. Uh, in a time for you to give this talk. Um, I uh, would now re uh, request uh, you know, one of our students to offer the vote of thanks. But before that, I have to take a moment to offer my thanks to 
Dr. Subhashri Bashu from Loreto College, Kolkata. It was she who had first pitched this idea. And uh, it is uh, because of her that we had uh, had a connection with uh, Dr. Wickman. And uh, so uh, here is um, our, our gratitude offered to Dr. Subhashri Bashu of Loreto College, assistant professor in the Department of English, Loreto College. And uh, I thank you, Paul. And I would now request uh, Hina Afrin, uh, undergrad student of Mitrapur College Autonomous, to offer a book of thanks. Hina, please take over. Thank you. Thank you, sir. A warm and graceful evening to one and all present here. All's well that ends well. And so does today's enthralling lecture. I am privileged enough to propose a vote of thanks and to acknowledge the contribution of every single hand to implement this international e-lecture on Shelley's Jesus, organized by Department of English, Mirnapur College. I, Ina Afrin, on behalf of Department of English, extend a hearty vote of thanks to our respected speaker, Dr. Paul Wickman, Senior Lecturer in English, University of Derby, UK. I am immensely thankful today for you share your contribution knowledge with us. I would also like to thank our respected principal sir, Dr. Gopal Chandra Vera, who has inspired us to arrange this wonderful virtual event. Heartfelt thanks to the Department of English for organizing this unprecedented international e lecture. Last but not the least, a big thank you to the audience for their active participation across the globe. We value you and every moment that you spent learning here. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Okay, Paul, once again, thank you. Hopefully, you will be in touch and be great. the attendance uh, between us. Once more.